even though it's so we're probably live at this point but i like to make sure i get to facebook before i uh officially start okay all right so um hello everyone i am sister rajan saitaki and here with me is Sister Alice Ann O'Neill. And we're just going to be continuing our conversation that we started on our podcast. <laughs> so how are you doing today, Alice Ann? I'm really great. I'm really great. I had a very good day, very full. Yeah, there's a, there's that say I think we said it on the podcast that Vincentian phrase of should wear yourself out for God every single day. So I'm pretty sure you and I take that literally. Yes, yes, I, I do think I do think we do. <laughs> very, very much so. Um, and the one big thing that everyone needs to know is today is Alice Ann's birthday and she has chosen to celebrate it with us. So have to say a really big happy birthday to you, Alice Ann. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, uh, this is actually also my entrance day. Is it really? This yeah. is your, oh, wow. So I entered on my 33rd birthday. Wow. Well, you'll never forget that day. That was a part of the idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Now, does your community count um, the years you're in community from your entrance or from your first house? From entrance. Yes. Mine mine does mine does the same. It's it's the from that entrance date. So I always find that fascinating in talking with sisters. Um, when, when I know it depends on where your community counts from, but, uh, I, I kind of am glad that everything counts, right? <laughs> <laughs> everything should count like from the beginning, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so uh, it, it's good. It's good. They make you wait before you decide to enter. That's, that's always sure. good. I think. <laughs> sure. I would agree. I would agree. How, how many years is your formation process in your community? Um, so initial formation is is three it's supposed to be three years one, we have uh two years as a postulant and one year as uh but we call them candidates so two years as candidates and one year as the canonical novice mm -hmm. what about for you i think that's similar we we had pre-entrance i don't know if they're changing the names of all the stages now but we okay. have pre-entrance where people are just looking at our community and just, you know, not in any kind of official relationship, but you do have a ceremony to sure. for pre-entrance. Sure. And, and I was just as terrified for that as I was for my first vows. Okay. Um, but then this next, and it could be one to three years. Okay. And then the next stage is affiliation and that's when you enter. And that could be one to three years, depending on, what's going on in your life and and when you're ready to move on and then novitiate is two years one is canonical novitiate then apostolic novitiate one year each then okay. temporary profession usually three years renewal two years or three years and then renewal and then uh it could be up to about nine or ten years long in total okay Okay. I was in formation for eight or nine years. Yes. I, yes. That, and that, that's similar. I, I, uh, I didn't, when I talked, I didn't really talk about the, the temporary profession piece for us, but yeah, that's anywhere. Uh, I think three to three to six years is what they say. So it's a little more, yeah, a little more fluid. However, for my initial formation, I did do it in four years. I, uh, I, I did extend um, as, as a candidacy, but you know, that's another story for another time. <laughs> yeah, somebody um, should interview you someday. Oh, well I did actually, Ma Sister Maxine did interview me um, prior to your podcast. So 
I'm oh, okay. Back. So I haven't missed it. You no, just you haven't missed it. It's yet. just, oh no, you have missed it. It's out there. I mean, you can oh. find it. You can find it. It is, it is there. I will find it tomorrow. <laughs> okay. I bet you will. Well, I'm just going to say hello again to all of those that are um, with us this evening. I'm Sister Regen uh, with uh, Sister Alice Ann, and we're continuing our conversation from the podcast that we recently released. If you have any questions you would like to al ask Alice Ann, just put them in the comment box and uh, we will bring them into our conversation. And the really cool thing is, uh, towards the end of our conversation, Alice, Sister Alice Ann will be playing her cello and, and weaving it into a, a prayer for us. So we have some, that'll be a real treat, a real treat for us tonight, for sure. Okay, I have to ask a question, Alice Ann, okay. you know, with the, the, I think it was either today or yesterday on our Facebook, is that amazing picture of you uh, as a younger version of you playing for princess diana and prince charles and i just want to know the story behind that that is that looks so cool well uh and on the podcast i've talked about where i grew up but when i was growing up canada was actually still part of england and i remember even watching the queen get off the plane with her little purse and it had our declaration of independence or whatever constitutional papers or something and that happened during my lifetime so Canada is still a commonwealth country and so the royals in fact I think Prince Charles and Camilla are coming in May to oh. Newfoundland okay. so they, they pretty regularly come there so I played in the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra when I was growing up and um, we played for the Queen and Prince Philip in Fredericton, New Brunswick one year. And then I was played in a fiddle group like every good maritimer does. And even though I was a cellist, I just played the bass line. And uh, we played for Prince Andrew, which was before he got married. And he was a young man. And then we played in 1982 for uh, Prince Charles and Princess Diana was a year like within the year after they got married I think they got married to 81 pretty sure yes I, I watched remember... that I got up early with my mom and we watched that I did too so did like most girls around the world I don't know at least every Canadian girl got up in the middle of the night and watched that yeah um, my mom was Canadian so they... see that's where it comes from that's right so um we uh they did a honeymoon tour i think they went to wales first and one other country and then they came to canada and they, it was a massive tour and new, they came to not only new brunswick but they came to the canabacases valley which is where i lived so that picture that i was in you know was all those people crowding behind us probably every single person who lived in our area was standing in that field just guessing and um <laughs> so our street our school orchestra not our youth orchestra like a regional thing it was our school orchestra uh, played for an hour and a half or so and we had like a whole classical set and that was supposed to be what we were playing when they walked by but it took them so long to get to where we were that we were on to the pop set, like the pop music set. And so we were playing um, the Beatles, Yellow Submarine, when they were walking by us. Okay. Which, ironically, she was wearing a yellow suit, but anyway. Yes. Uh, Prince Charles actually plays a cello. Really? So, and he didn't know what we were playing, because he probably never heard the Beatles, just guessing. And <laughs> And so he came, walked over to me and looked over my shoulder at the music and then came, and then Princess Dyke walked over too and then they were chatting with each other and he was saying something by the Beatles and she says oh yes I know that I heard them talking but we were under pain of death 
from our conductor, our school teacher, that we could not look at them. Because can you imagine the whole orchestra just turns and looks and we all stop playing? Yes, it's so true. I'm, we were not allowed to look, but at least I got to hear their voices. Oh my gosh. And how old were you? I was 12. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That That's a cool moment. That's a real, real cool moment. Well, and I, uh, a year later, was in a bookstore and I saw a, a commemorative book about their visit to Canada and I opened it up and there was a picture of me. That picture. <gasps> Really? That was in some book, like Prince Charles and Diana visit of Canada or some visit Canada. Oh my gosh. That's probably the only reason why I have that picture because it was in the book. Okay. Okay. And then have you, have you played for other famous people or is that probably the most memorative time? Well, I mean, before I entered, I used to play a lot of concerts. So I, I've played for Mannheim Steamroller, like their Christmas concert. And, okay. I, you know, there's all these people who used to tour around and then they hire an orchestra and I'd play in the orchestra. Okay. Uh, I don't know that I could list all of them. Probably everyone that came through Baltimore and Columbus. <laughs> sure. Yes. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I have, to, I have to tell you in the chat, you've got a lot of happy birthday wishes coming your way. Wow. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Elizabeth and Joan O'Keefe. Um, and then oh, Joan O'Keefe's a Halifax charity. Oh, is she? Her. Great. Yes. And, and Keith Pryor, he says, we love you, Alice Ann. That's my cousin. Oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so feel free. Those of you that are listening, you can keep your comments coming. I will definitely do a scroll down from time to time. And we can always, um, add it right into our conversation. So. All right. Um, now, I have a question for you. You know, in the podcast, you talked about um, getting an advanced degree, right? Your PhD. And why why did you want or feel the need to get an advanced degree? Because I think professional musicians don't, don't have to have that. Am I correct? Oh, no, they don't have to have that. Um... I really, actually, when I finished my undergrad, all I wanted to do was play and just play all day. So I just played, I, I taught very little. I mostly played and mm -hmm. a lot of chamber music, string quartet things. I had a professional piano trio that I played in for a while. And um, then I started getting into Suzuki teaching more and I had more training in Suzuki and there was, I tried out for a couple of jobs and, and this was when I lived on the East Coast and I actually lost the jobs because I didn't have a master's degree. So then I started thinking, oh. well, I guess I better go back to school, but I was loving working and I, I really didn't want to go back to school. So it was five and a half years before it was in my late 20s when I went back to get go to grad school and I absolutely loved it it's so much better than going to undergrad um why uh, well just because you can I I don't know it seemed like undergrad had a lot of tests mm -hmm. and grad school you know you mostly research and go deeper on things and then do presentations and write papers and you know that just appealed to me so much more and um, I really got into, in my master's degree, I went to school in Illinois and I did a long-term training program for Suzuki teaching. So I got all of my training there, the rest of all the advanced books I didn't have yet. And um, I, my, I started teaching Suzuki there also but then my teacher, my cello teacher, went to New Zealand to teach for like six weeks or something. And I took her place. And I started, I taught all of the college kids. And I caught, taught all her classes. And so I, I loved it. I was shocked, actually. 
and and I just love teaching it and I love trying to you know mentor the university students and um, I really it was like being on a high like for those six weeks and then I felt like that's what I wanted to do was to get a job like her and so she recommended that I get a doctorate and um, in in music at least then when I got that it was it was pretty challenging to get into doctoral programs you had to have had five to seven years of professional work so you couldn't go straight through school now you can but oh interesting you could, okay you had to have th pro show proficiency in three languages written and spoken oh yeah, yeah. And also because I talked about this on the podcast, I wanted to um, study music research. And so I, I was really intense in studying educational research. So I took um, statistics courses, like voluntarily. That's how much of a geek I am. And I took the egg statistic courses because Ohio State's got really good uh, research courses that way and then I took a lot of um, graduate courses in the education department and child psychology I mean it was just such a broad wonderful education at Ohio State and um, that's why I ended up going there and I just love it I, I still love it I think if I could get three doctorates I probably would it's just I wouldn't want to write the dissertation again <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. Oh. I know, but there's, once you learn about something, you just want to go deeper and learn more about it. And then the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And yeah. so then you want to learn more. So <laughs> I, all in all, I ended up going to university for like 11 and a half years or 12 years. Oh my gosh. Well, it's interesting to hear your philosophy. Like you want to go deeper where just, just, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I just have to say, I like to go broader. So I like the master's degrees because it's just the right amount of information. And then, and then I can let it go and move on to something else. Whereas I don't know if I could stick it out and go deeper and so focused, um, that that's not my style. <laughs> Wait, so you I, have I, several I masters, right? How many masters? Uh, I've got a, I've got two. I got two masters. So I mean, I put in the amount of schooling. I have two bachelors and two masters. So I put in the same amount of schooling as my father. My father has a PhD, and he's like, "Why didn't you just get the PhD?" Oh well, oh well. I like you're, you're exactly right. That's the reason why, because the PhD you have to take one or like what I did, which was two very pinpointed specific fields right. and um and i had to play six uh six recitals for that degree and then the language proficiency even but then um taking the music ed research courses was completely fascinating and i always chose suzuki teaching in all you... of my subjects. So that was, uh... cause there was hardly any research done in that field. So you already had from that, that six weeks period, right? Working, um, subbing for your, your teacher, right? With Suzuki, am I right? So that kind of struck your fancy with Suzuki? Well, I had already been teaching Suzuki teaching. before okay. I went back to, for my master's. Okay. But okay. What, okay. when she left, I subbed for her university teaching okay that's why she told me to go get a doctorate and then i could um get a job as a university teacher which i did for 25 years <laughs> wow okay so which languages are you proficient in well in canada all decent canadians and took french okay and so um in our province of new brunswick it's the only bilingual province in canada Oh. And so uh, I went to actually to French immersion uh, program. So by the time we graduate high school, um, you actually get tested. There's like a national test for bilingual speaking and you had to get a certain number on that test and you need to be declared bilingual. Okay. So 
bilingual, but I'll put in quotations Acadian French. It's not the same as Quebec French, and it's not the same as oh. France French. Okay. We get, there's like a, it's a very different accent, but it's also a very different way of, of speaking. I had no idea that, that there was another, a second. Uh, I knew about the Quebecois. Yeah, but I didn't realize there was Acadian also yeah. in Canada. Okay. Acadien. Acadien. And, um, Acadia, there's a large, there was a large population of Acadians in New Brunswick. A, a lot of them died. Um, and then the, the Cajuns that lived down in New Orleans mm -hmm. actually came from Nova Scotia Acadian communities. So oh. they were being persecuted by the British. And so they um, actually fled in a, in boats and went down around Florida and landed in New Orleans. That's a long trip. Oh my gosh. So I, I teach in, in a Suzuki Institute in Louisiana uh, for several summers now. And there are people in Louisiana with similar accents as the Maritime Acadien. So... <sighs> That's that's really fascinating. Oh yeah. my gosh. Okay, so what's the other language? Obviously English. So what's well, your third? If you if you know French, you pretty much can know Italian. Okay. And I've been to Italy a lot of times and I love it. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of soak it in. And so I, I can read Italian pretty well and I can speak it decently. And then um uh, the third language you could just show reading ability, so it was German. Oh, okay, okay. So you did you you did the the German when you were in the doctorate. Is that what you? Yeah, but kind of languages are easy for me, so okay. I don't have to study them that much. I can just do it. So <sighs> what I a went, gift! Well, I don't. I think it's musician ear. Okay. You know, you and then when you understand one other language, then you can other, understand other languages sort of similarly. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I went to Japan for a Suzuki teachers conference and I was there for three weeks and I could actually have like small conversations with people when I left. Wow. But I couldn't do it now. I'd have to like be talking to Japanese people, hearing Japanese to do it. Wow. I don't know if it's like some button that presses in your brain and then suddenly you can access something Japanese. I don't know. That is so, um, that is just so amazing. I, I did not know that you were such a, a linguist. Well, not, not, in, not in the uh, professional standpoint, but that you've got so many different languages. That's. That's a really good gift to have. I've been trying to get some more Spanish, which would be much more practical living in the okay. U.S. Yeah. And I, I can understand most Spanish, but I can't. Uh, I have to be in the environment to be able to think that way. Sure. So I think sure. in the language that I'm trying to talk in. I don't like translate it. Right. Right. So I have to be hearing it and then okay. I can kind of flow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I have a friend who knows seven languages and he says before he goes to that country, because he works for the United Nations, he takes two days and just immerses himself in reading and listening to it. And it's kind of like what you just said, hit, hit a button and then he, then he can start thinking in it and um, shift over. Um, See, this, this shelf right here is uh -huh. all my language dictionaries. Oh my gosh. And so whenever I go to Europe or another country, I get like Lonely Planet or, you know, Rick Steves Guide or something. And they have like these little tiny uh, language books, like how to survive. So I read it on the plane going over. And, and then if I don't know the pronunciation, I just listen on YouTube for a little bit. And then you can survive if you have to get a ticket at the airport or the train station and so right but right i love languages that is that is so cool okay so i'm going to go back to something else in the podcast kind of switching gears you know we didn't talk too much about um 
you know, when, when you were younger, you alluded in the podcast that you, you felt called to religious life. Um, we talked a lot about kind of that second time around, um, after you had kind of, um, let go of that dream, but, um, can you talk about, um, that, that initial call and with the, and it was sisters of charity as well, but when you were younger, uh, so this is interesting. I was thinking about this today okay. uh, because there is a sister of the precious blood who lives around the corner from me. And I actually met her when I was 16 in New Brunswick. I mean, and she's from the precious blood sisters, which is from Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that happen? But, um, I went in, when I was 16, I went on a youth retreat, like um, youth encounter or I don't, teen encounter. That's what it was called, teen encounter. And we had in our valley, um, the, the churches, I guess two churches decided to merge their Anglican teens with their, their Catholic teens in our valley. So we all went on this retreat together and each room, you, your roommate was always someone from the opposite. You know, so there was always one Anglican, one Catholic. Anglican for Americans, by the way, is Episcopalian. It's basically like British Catholics. Of course, they would never call it that, but. That's right, right. I know there is still is somewhat of a difference, but yes. This is a long <laughs> bloody story about Henry VIII that would explain <laughs> that, but we don't need to go there. No, we don't. <laughs> um, in any case, it was a lovely retreat. And this, um, uh, the youth group leaders, I used to go to that prayer group every week, we, the C, um, CYO, mm -hmm. Catholic Youth Organization. And um, there was a sister of charity of the Immaculate Conception, who's in St. John, that was there, Sister Nikki, and uh, S Father Stan, Paul Stanislav Paulin, who's still a priest in St. John, in Rossi, actually. And then they invited the sister who was, I think, in theology school in New Hampshire. And um, she came, and I just never saw anybody like that before she had spiky hair she was real boisterous and strong and she played the guitar excellently mm. and so i just like i just watched her all through the retreat and i i just thought i think i'm like that i think that's like me mm. it even it was not like a conscious thing it was sort of like i think i know that's sort of like me and after that, I started thinking about joint becoming a sister. And um, so actually, I started meeting with one of the Sisters of Charity of the Immaculate Conception when I was 16. And she kind of like a spiritual director. Uh, but I mean, you're only 16. Like, it's not really spiritual direction. But she would meet with me once a month. And we would talk, and sometimes I would go to her house for lunch. And uh, she actually taught me to pray. She taught me the rosary, which wasn't being taught in parishes at that time. Okay. So I didn't actually know how to do that because my family didn't say the rosary as a family. Um, so she taught me some more traditional Catholic prayers, which I was really grateful to know. And then she told me about the daily readings book. And so I, that was when I first got a subscription to, I can't even remember what the Canadian version was called, not this day, but something else. And I started reading the scripture every day for, you know, the daily scripture. And so uh, that's when my prayer life really started, I think, when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And then I asked to join their community when I was 18, and they were so kind to such a naive young person such as myself. And they they said, okay, okay, you can uh, you can uh, keep discerning with us, but you have to go and get your degree. Okay. And um, 
Uh, so basically, they I went to Boston University, and they called uh, Boston University Newman Center, and at that time there was the sister of charity of Halifax who worked there, who's uh, Mary Sweeney. She's still in Boston. Okay. And uh, she became my spiritual director, and she was my director for the whole four years I was in college. And I, I met her almost every week. Wow. So I learned so much from wow. lots of Sisters of Charity, and it was it was a very blessed um, serendipity that those people were there. I didn't finish the story about the Precious Blood Sister. Yes, go back and do that. Okay, because I didn't, I don't even think I remembered her name, you know, and so uh, there was a sister who was working, I think somewhere in North, by Toledo for a lot of years, and then she came down, she lives with one of our sisters, um, and so uh, Judy, my friend that I live with, and I became friends with them, we were at their house for dinner one night. And the sister kept saying, well, I went to New Brunswick once. And then we just kept coming around. And then she'd say, wait, now, I was there doing a teen retreat. And and the, then we kept circling around. We're like, wait a second, what year was that? And we figured out that she was the person at that retreat. Oh, she my lives, goodness. She lives around the corner from me. She's my really good friend. Now, as in right now <laughs> she, t she works at our college oh my gosh right i mean right. This is just like serendipity coming around everywhere and i think that god really does take care mm -hmm. of you know putting the right people in your life when you need them mm -hmm. i found that to be true anyhow oh right right and that that you i mean and, and just like when you look at your your story it it's always kind of been um, there's been this theme with in the charity federation too. Um, That's right. And uh, and so you can truly say you've been formed by several different groups of charities. Um, right. Well, and I should tell you the other part of my federation story, which is my mom went to New York Charity um, School growing up. Oh. So my unofficial theory is that some New York charity made a prayer one day in my mom's class and said, please let the daughter, the first daughter of each of these young ladies become a sister. And here I am. Oh, I love it. I love that story. Oh my gosh. My mom grew up in New Rochelle, New York. And so she went to school in Rye, New York. Rye. And that was a ch New York charity school. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm, I want to um, I'm get in the chat. There have been a couple things in there. I think when you were talking about language, um, both um, Sister Maria Victoria and uh, Kutaya and Sister Irene were like amazed with the, the language. Maria, Maria Victoria could totally identify with what you were saying. And oh, cool. Sister Irene is like, I never got that gene. <laughs> 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 well, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, you can. I'm a musician, so I always believe if you just practice, you can also get there. Everyone can learn. Well, I, just um, for the record, I've been trying to learn Spanish for 20 years, and I'm still learning. <laughs> well, maybe I, you should try Chinese instead, and maybe it'll work better. I don't know. I don't know. But I do understand a fair amount of it, but I'm just not very grammatically correct. Um, that's but I, I can get my point across. Mm -hmm. Oh, golly. It's too well, bad I, we can't see the chats here. I know, I know. I, Are I keep there my, any questions? I have coming? not gotten any questions. I'll, I'll put that, that out again. If anyone uh, has any questions for Alice Ann, this is your chance to, to ask anything that came up in the podcast or just in our conversation as she and I have been talking. Um, and my cousin better not ask anything embarrassing. Uh, did you hear that, Keith? Now I've got <laughs> I've got one. Kathy O'Neill Mockler said, "Alison, you are amazing." With a and big she heart. is my cousin too. Oh, hi, uh, Kathy. They've known me since I was a little runt. Oh boy. <laughs> and we all got in trouble together. <laughs> 
Oh, you got a good story from that one? Uh, not that I'm going to tell. Share. Well, 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 yeah. Fair enough. Let's oh. just say we've jumped on a lot of beds, right, Keith? Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Um, I, you know, okay, so we've got, here's, here's one from Sarah P. McRae. What's your favorite thing about the cello? Oh, my. Do I have to say only one thing? <laughs> I'll let you have a couple. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I can, I've tried even, you know, in music school, you can take classes to study all the instruments because uh, school teachers, like public school teachers or whatever, they have to learn how to play all the instruments. So I decided I would take all the classes and try all the instruments to see what I was missing out on, see? And I found out that nothing is as good as a cello. Now, granted, I am biased. Yes. But um, yes. the cello, the sounds of the cello, I think the range of it, you know, that there's such low notes and then high notes and everything in between. Um, it's the sound is what gets me every time. And I think because the back of the cello actually rests on your sternum, which is the bone that comes between your ribs. Um, and then uh, you touch it also here and you touch it through the horse hair on the bow. So you have three points of touching on your body with the instrument. It actually vibrates and it kind of sometimes it actually kind of tickles your bones hmm. and it, it's just like an amazing feeling and to try so many different sounds uh you know over the years i can't even remember i've played since 1978 so um that's a lot of years and that i mean over those years i've probably played just about every note your sound you could make on the cello but then people compose new pieces and then they make new sounds that you never thought of, about making. Um, such as recently, they, they started a technique called chopping, which yeah. is a kind of a rock sound. It sounds like it's electric, but then you do it with your bow. And every time I hear new sounds on the cello, it's just thrilling to me. So let me just say those are my top three reasons that is awesome and i think this is a this is a good segue that we would like to hear you play that cello oh wow. really yes well, I've the, got, yeah the other thing i'd say about the cello is it's kind of you you know it's kind of alive it's like a person mm. and um the cello is made out of three and four uh, different kinds of wood so if you think the trees that were harvesting the wood from, they were alive. So like there's an energetic uh, attachment to the wood. So I think that when you play an instrument, especially wood instrument, I don't know if it's like that with brass because that's kind of like a man-made, uh, you know, material or uh, silver. I guess silver is natural too, isn't it? And actually I've seen a gold flute and a gold trumpet. So wow. gold is a, a natural mineral to the earth. But uh, wood is just, it's like trees. Every tree has a kind of a life to it. And that life I think gets carried into the instrument. But uh, over the years I've had different cellos and the people who play the cello I think leave a mark on the instrument too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how to explain that, mm -hmm. but it's something I kind of picked up, you know, and there's some other people who think that way too. So I've always named my cellos. So what is your current cello named? Well, I the I do have the same cello that I played in high school, not the one that was in the picture with Prince Charles. Um, but the cello I played since high school was named is named Rachel, okay. and um, I 
loaned that cello to a student, a former student of mine who lives in Abu Dhabi. And so right now Rachel's in Abu Dhabi. Oh. But it's really cool because I still sometimes teach her on Zoom. And so I get to hear Rachel still. Wow. And Rachel's having this whole adventure going off to the Middle East and playing really interesting music and Mozart and Bach still. And is Abu Dhabi, is that Ethiopia? No, the it's United the Arab Emirates. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was like, I, I, I'm, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, that's uh, one of my cellos, and I've played that cello for a long time. Um, and then this cello that I, my, my really good cello now is called Jeanette. Um, because she was made in Paris, so she's got some good French, but she was made by an Italian. Oh. So she's got some Italian blood, but she's using French wood. Wow. And wow. so, you know, people from different countries have different characteristics sometimes, you know, kind of personalities that might match certain cultures. and. Uh, she really does blend like some passionate Italian and very precise loveliness of Paris. Wow. So, and the person who gave me this cello was named Lily Jeanette. So Hence I, her name. So I took part of her name to help. And um, so I... Uh, love this cello and it was made in 1764. Oh so my. Think about, think about your history. It survived the French Revolution and still is intact. Oh my gosh. Oh my so, gosh. So I mean these instruments like have lives too just like people so. Yeah. And they make music and they make music with different characteristics and qualities so I think that it's 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 appropriate to give them names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, can you introduce us to Jeanette? Sure, sure. Just a moment here. Okay. While you're while you're getting Jeanette ready, um, Margaret Slavin said hello with Carol Carolyn Pratt. Oh, okay. Hi. Yeah, and and uh, when you were talking about your your nephew, no, no, your cousin Keith, and some of the stories, he put a, a nice emoji on there where he's kind of um, laughing. <laughs> it's good he's being reserved about his. <laughs> no, my cousin's hilarious. Oh, I bet. I bet. All my cousins are wonderful people. Sure. Sure. So, you are we done with all the questions and everything? It, yes. Uh, there's nothing else in the chat, so I think we'll we can. Uh, yeah, hear you play. Okay. Right. So I was thinking we would uh, do kind of like a prayer. Great. And um, so I'm going, it's kind of like a guided meditation just to get started okay. um, and help everybody kind of just come into a more restful state, uh, present. And then I'll just uh, play what comes. Okay. Jeanette will play what comes. <laughs> So if we can close our eyes or if you're comfortable with your eyes open, whichever, mm -hmm. and just sit or lay down wherever you can rest. And just imagine that your feet are like the roots on a tree reaching down deep in the earth. Take a deep breath in and let it out slowly. And let go of all of the running around you did today. All of the things that you were concerned about and you carried out. 
and you come to this present moment. Take another deep breath in and let go of your worries about tomorrow. Another deep breath in and imagine that the sky is coming down to meet you almost like a hug to hold you in comfort. The earth and sky meeting where you are. Right here now. And let us just rest in this moment together, knowing that God is always present. May God's blessings come on all of you now and always. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you. I feel so blessed to have had this time with you. Me too. Oh. I always love talking to you. Oh. And a very happy birthday. Thank you. Very, this is a very... wonderful way to celebrate with friends. Yes. Okay. A couple more things came in on the chat. One actually says Alice O'Neill, and it says, hello from mom. <laughs> My mom. Is that hi. your mom? Yeah. I figured yes. that might be nice to, that your mom said hi. <laughs> happy birthday to you, mom. <laughs> And then Carolyn Pratt said, thanks, Margaret. I played cello in St. John Symphony for a few years when you were there. So they, right. they uh, both said hi. Um, and thanks yes. Thanks for coming. Yes. I got a heart from Joan O'Keefe. Mar Margaret said, thank you for the invitation to this Facebook Live time. I hear the spirit moving in your life experiences. And... I agree. The Holy Spirit moves through yeah. everything that happens, I believe. Yeah. Lots of Elizabeth says happy birthday. Lots of, and uh, Car Carolyn said that was gorgeous and very prayerful. So thank you very much. Thanks Aww. for listening, everybody. And I hope you feel blessed on your birthday too with all this oh, um, I do. love I coming just... your way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is kind of strange. I've never done this before, but mm -hmm. you do kind of feel connected to people Good. who are watching. And, you know, I feel that when I teach on Zoom, that sure. you, you know, you're connected to the person you're with. So I guess that would be true, even if you had a larger group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, I'm sure you and I will talk again soon. 
um we just say thank you to all all of you in our audience thank you for joining thank us you. this night and just have a blessed evening and blessings to Rajin and everyone who helped on the podcast. She's got a wonderful crew of people that help. And um, it's a really amazing ministry. And many blessings on your ministry, Rajin. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Have a nice night. Bye. Bye. Bye.